Bruh. Right, one last person to admit. Okay, I think we can start now. Hello everyone, welcome to our second guest presentation. So, today's speaker is Mr. Sean Fickling, who holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from SFU. He is currently a senior researcher at Health Tech Onyx, Inc. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Sean Fickling. Um, this is a rough schedule, so from seven till whenever uh, Mr. Sean Fickling chooses to stop his presentation, he will be um, discussing about his research and advice for future biomed engineers, amongst other topics. Afterwards, we'll be hosting a Q&A session from 7.40 to 8 p.m., or from whenever he stops his presentation till 8 p.m. So the rules of this presentation. First, please mute yourself during the presentation. Thank you. Second, please put your questions in the comment section during the presentation. It will be a lot more organized for us. We will read off your questions after he has finished your presentations. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send a message to one of our co-hosts. All right. Can I hand the presentation over to you now, Mr. Fickley? Absolutely. Thank you, Tommy. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, oh, can you enable me to, to share? I've got a presentation. All right. Let's see. That would be great. Ooh, um, I see make host, allow to record, allow to multi-pin. Is that the thing? I think so. I think it, this should be a share screen option for the, uh, the host to enable uh, participants to share. All right. Um, good, old, <laughs> good old Zoom challenges. All right, should have brought this up earlier. I find <laughs> it a lot easier just to, to talk through with, with pictures. Um, um, Here's multiple participants can share screens on page. Does there that we go. <clears throat> that works. Uh, <laughs> screen two. All right, there we go. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see that. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I, I guess we'll give you a bit of an overview on, on biomedical engineering uh, tonight and really just give you maybe a bit more insight into what I do and, and how that fits into the broader world of biome biomedical engineering and then just to allow you to answer some questions. Uh, so my name is Sean Fickling. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to be a biomedical engineer <laughs> many years ago when I was in high school. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to, to create things or build things. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to be an engineer in, in some in some shape or form. I couldn't decide if I wanted to do electrical engineering or computer engineering or uh, mechanical engineering. And so I ended up doing mechatronics, which is kind of a combination of everything um, because I was really interested in robots and really interested in, in robotics. And through that process, um, I, I think it was in my final year of my undergraduate, I took a, an elective in biomedical engineering uh, where one of the projects was uh, designing a prosthetic knee or, or a, you know, something like that. And, and that really captured my interest. And, and so once I finished my undergrad, I started then pursuing uh, a, a master's in science in biomedical engineering focused on like movement and biomechanics and, and looking, at knee, looking at knee injuries. Uh, and through that process, um, yeah, I kind of got introduced in, into this concept of biomedical engineering. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. But... It was around that time uh, I, I I was a rugby player for many years and I received a really bad concussion uh, and really struggled with it for a while because it was, you know, at the time and, and really concussion now is still uh, not very well understood 
Uh, so, you know, you get injured, you go to the doctor and you're like, all right, well, how bad is it? And the doctor says, well, we don't really know. You go, okay, well, <laughs> how, you know, how long, how long is it going to be this way? And like, well, we don't really know. We just kind of have to wait and see. Um, and so there's just a lack of treatment for concussion, a lack of monitoring equipment for concussion, you know, the same way that if you break your wrist, you know, we can, we can take an x-ray and we can show you broken bones. Like there's no, there's no equivalent for concussion uh, right now. And so that kind of sparked my interest into, into the brain and how the brain works. And, um, and so that, that led me on the path to, to doing a PhD in engineering science, focusing on neurotechnology or brain technologies um, and specifically focusing on concussions and brain injury. And so a lot of, <laughs> I've done a lot of different things in my research and, and in my kind of career so far. Um, I just finished my PhD last year, so still very, very fresh at this. But basically, like, the things I'm really interested in uh, are on this board. I'm really interested in digital health or uh, using technologies to, to enable health and wellness, uh, specifically around neurotechnology. Uh, for me, really interested in the brain, and, and we'll, we'll touch more on that uh, in, in a little bit later. And then also this, this kind of new buzzword that's called data science, which is really just a hybrid of um, machine learning and statistics and, and data analytics. And so really using uh, data tools to be able to create insights uh, related to like medical technologies. Um, and yeah, so, you know, applications, as I, as I mentioned, very concussion and brain injury focused, but I've also done a lot of work in aging and mental health. Um, and then I guess related but unrelated, huge fan of, of science fiction, uh, I love going outdoors and, and playing board games. Uh, you know, all, all three of those things have been really useful during the during the pandemic. So it's keeping me busy. Now, when when most people hear biomedical engineering, the first thing they think of is like, oh, you, you must build like robotic limbs or prosthetics or orthotics. And despite that being my my entry into the career, uh, that's not all that biomedical engineering is. Biomedical engineering is actually quite a lot of things. Uh, in, in a very big picture level, biomedical engineering is the application of engineering principles and design concepts to medicine and biology for the purposes of healthcare. And so that, that's really broad. And so there are a lot of different spheres of, of biomedical engineering. And, and there's a great, actually a really good Wikipedia list uh, that'll send you down a, a Wikipedia rabbit hole um, of all the different like fields of, of, of biomedical engineering. And, and there are a lot, you know, there's uh, biomechanics and implants and um, bionics, which is kind of more on the movement, prosthetic, orthotic uh, side of things. There's tissue engineering, biomaterials, bio-optics, pharmaceuticals, genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is like one of the most uh, incredible emerging technologies right now. The ability to rapidly sequence DNA I have some really, really, really cool companies out there doing some really interesting stuff. Uh, obviously, you know, the COVID pandemic has, has brought that to the forefront as well. Um, but th there are a lot of different fields of, of biomedical, biomedical engineering. Um, and so I guess the, the take home message here is it really is it's the application of engineering or the use of technology in some cases uh, applied to medicine and applied to science for the purposes of healthcare. Uh, for myself, um, I'm just going to activate the laser pointer there. Uh, for myself, I kind of focus in this realm these days. I'm very much in the medical devices, medical imaging. Um, I don't do so much biomechanics anymore, but I'm still quite interested in it. Most of my research and, and my work these, uh, these days is focused in medical devices and, and medical imaging uh, with a little bit of neural engineering uh, thrown, in, thrown in for good measure. Uh, so I think most of what I'll talk about now is really more on the medical device side because that's just what I'm experienced in and, and that's what I work with. Uh, I am happy to answer questions on, on other areas of biomedical engineering at the end. Um, but I think, you know, talk about what you know and, and I know medical devices. So a medical device is a system that is intended to be used for diagnosis, monitoring, prevention or treatment of a medical or a health issue. Um, System is kind of creatively used there because it's not, it could be software, it could be hardware, it could be, uh, you know, AI, any, any kind of thing, entity that is intended to be used for one of these uh, purposes is classed as a medical device. And that has a lot of um, implications. So career in, in medical device in terms of product life cycles. So uh, let's use an example. I'll, I'll get to what I do specifically at the end. So 
uh, right now, let's let's imagine a, a fictional medical device. Um, uh, I, I don't know, what's on my head? Uh, a portable uh, heart rate monitor, that, that's pretty simple. It's really, um, you know, these things have been done before. But let, let's say that uh, all of us on this call today, we decided to start a company and our company would sell a wearable heart, like heart rate monitor that would monitor your heart rate in real time. And it would be able to predict if someone was about to have a heart attack uh, before it happened, right? So, you know, obviously very important. Uh, if I have something on my person that knows I'm about to have a heart attack, it can alert the authority, you know, it can alert <clears throat> 911 or an ambulance uh, prior to what happens. It can uh, signal help from someone else, you know, get an AED. Like there's a lot of different outcomes. Obviously with heart attacks or, you know, strokes or any kind of like sudden onset medical uh, emergency, the time to response is, is very important. So our company that we've all created now, uh, we want to have this product. Uh, now, it's not as simple as just building it and then selling it. Like it, in some industries, you're able to do it. In the software industry, you know, like YouTube was created in a weekend because the, the person who coded it came up with the idea, sat down, 48 hours later, they coded it and they released it. Now, medical devices are not that simple and I'll get to why that is right now. So as you'll see, this is, <laughs> this is a circle. This is, not a, this is not a line with product at the end and you know, all the stuff you have to do to get to there in the beginning, right? Um, so I'll start, with, I'll start with idea. So now we as a company, we know our idea. We're like, okay, we just have this idea. We're gonna use, uh, technology to predict heart attacks. And that's gonna be a wearable technology. Now, in order to do that, we need to do something, we need to gather some data and that's really exploration. Well, who needs to, who needs to use this? Is it, uh, you know, is it teenagers that really are at high risk of heart attacks? No, probably not. You know, it's typically people above the age of, of 65. So what are their needs? Like, let's try and understand the needs of people with heart attack. Uh, do they wear watches? Uh, you know, do they already have watches? Would they wear, like, there's a whole lot of user exploration in terms of the idea phase that you have to go through. Um, and this isn't even getting to the actual development yet, right? So now once, you know, we might, we might gather some data in terms of like user requirements um, so that we can start to build a prototype. Now in building a prototype, uh, you obviously not, you don't have a lot of money necessarily in the beginning of your device. Uh, so you're kind of bootstrapping, you're pulling things together. Your prototype is often kind of, you know, lots of wires everywhere. It looks very you know, sciencey and engineering, um, but you have to be able to test it. So, you know, in order to, once you have a, a small little prototype, you want to gather some data. This is actually great. There's a little heart rate monitor there. Uh, so now we have to put it on people, right? Um, so now we have to go, okay, well, what we've built, does it do what we say it's supposed to do? Can we measure heart rate? Can we measure blood pressure? Can we predict heart attacks? So you kind of go through the cycle uh, of device testing and go, okay, well, now that we have, um, we have a small prototype device, does it work? Uh, if it doesn't work, go back in R&D. If it doesn't work again, go back into idea. And you kind of go through the cycle and you iteratively loop from phase to phase to phase. Now, once we get to something where we go, okay, well, now we have something that's working, let's try it out. You then have to do what's called clinical trials. And so clinical trials is, is uh, you might've heard this before. Uh, actually, yeah, COVID's a, a um, good example of that because uh, you know vaccines don't just get made and then get released. They go through a, 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 a period of testing where they, they test on a small group first, which is their feasibility. Um, once it's shown to be safe, once it's shown to be uh, effective, then you move into larger and larger stages. And so now your clinical trial is really like, okay, well now we want, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to, to use our device um, so that we can see, we can see if it works. And once we gather that data, uh, only then we can take it to market and we can start selling it. Because uh, from a, like a risk perspective, if we created a device that we said would predict heart attacks uh, and we start selling it and it doesn't predict heart attacks, there's a problem, right? Uh, we're liable for 
uh, you know, some, some serious issues there. So, and then, you know, once you've released it into the market, there's, you know, what they call post-market analysis that feeds back. So now the people are wearing it, they might have complaints or they might have uh, feedback that might give you new ideas for new features that then go through this, this cycle all over again. And so this process can, you know, it goes on indefinitely and medical device companies are always at some or multiple stages of this cycle at any point in time where they're either uh, developing a new product, they're either exploring an idea, they are, uh, you know, doing R&D on a version of the product while they're already bringing another version to clinical trials. Um, and there's a lot of work and a lot of things that need to be done in all this, you know, but just the R and D is a lot of, um, hands-on coding, creating, building, uh, and then testing in clinical trials is a whole different division of, of science as well. And then the analytics, uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of really cool, uh, opportunities to do this. Um, and unfortunately it, it does take a little bit more time, but I, I quite like, uh, going through the, the process now. I don't want to dive too much into this because I think I touched on the previous slide, but regulatory compliance is one of the things that, that tends to hold up medical devices a little bit, but it's obviously really important. Uh, you may have heard of the FDA or Health Canada. Uh, these are authorities that you basically need to get approval from uh, to be able to take your device to market. So if we want to say that our device predicts heart attacks, uh, we have to be able to demonstrate that to the FDA or to Health Canada with all the data that shows that we can, in fact, do what we say we do. And then they essentially give you the stamp of approval that says, okay, great. Uh, you've shown, you know, you've shown that your device works. Uh, now you can go and you can go and sell it. So kind of pivoting a little bit here. Uh, we're in a really, really, really interesting phase of, uh, technology. Um, there are a lot of really brilliant new, what they call disruptive technologies that are kind of emerging at the forefront now. And these are pre presenting a lot of uh, really interesting opportunities for, for integration within healthcare and within medical devices. Um, artificial intelligence over here is, is one. AI is probably going to be one of the, one of the biggest most beneficial um, tools for diagnostics. Uh, you know, a lot of healthcare is gathering information and presenting that to a uh, clinician or a doctor who then has to kind of internalize all of that and make a decision around, uh, you know, in, in my case, concussion or not concussion. You know, is this person concussed or they're not concussed? Are they healthy? Have they returned to normal? Um, AI, big data, uh, these um, like deep learning networks are able to, to gather incredible amounts of information and are able to make very, very, very complex decisions, excuse me, very quickly and very easily. And so AI is gonna be great and it really has an opportunity to help healthcare in a lot of ways. Obviously uh, oil and gas and renewable energy, maybe not so much related to, to healthcare, um, but look at like global internet penetration, like how we're now able to, to provide healthcare to people in remote areas through Zoom, which we wouldn't have been able to do, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, now that we can get A, internet into remote places and B, we can virtually interact with each other through these platforms. Um, the internet of things, 5G, uh, creating, you know, portable, lightweight, low energy wireless devices that interface, you know, for, I'll, I'll use our hot, our, um, uh, sorry, heart attack predicted device as an example, um, you know, 10 years ago, that would have been a, really not a wearable. It would have had to have been something that someone would have had to strap around their chest. Whereas now we have these tiny sensors on little chips that we could just, you know, put on some skin or on their wrist or on their finger, and it'll just wirelessly connect with a cell phone and update data to, you know, to the cloud. Um, advanced robotics, there's some, incredibly uh, sophisticated companies coming out now that are providing uh, robots that can do surgeries with unprecedented like precision uh, that are still controlled by, by a surgeon or by an experienced operator, but, you know, don't suffer from fatigue. Don't make, you know, mistakes or slips or, um, you know, they just have 
the ability to enhance, you know, medical care that we already have. Um, I've mentioned genomics a little bit and, and gene sequencing, 3D printing. Uh, I, I just, I beg you to Google, you know, 3D printing of, of stem cells and organs and, and all these things that, that uh, people are creating opportunities to, to develop, you know, new organs for people who need the new limbs. Uh, we're obviously not there yet, but the, the technology is, is really getting there. And then last, um, at least on this list, you know, if you Google new technologies, there's, there's hundreds of these, but virtual and augmented reality is very much a tool um, from gaming. You know, it, it started out as something that's more entertainment focused, but now people are using VR to, to train uh, surgeons in surgery techniques, you know, because you can go through, uh, you know, hundreds of practice surgeries in VR that are highly accurate and, and real uh, realistic. Uh, but they don't have the risk, so they, they can make the mistakes in a simulated environment, and then when they're experienced in practice, can go do surgeries on real people. Uh, you know, that's just a that's just a tiny example. So, the field of uh, medical technology for me is is becoming this exciting, uh, new, you know, new frontier of all these new technologies that are being used in other areas that we can now integrate into healthcare uh, to create really, you know, quite useful uh, devices to, to help people. And so for me, my focus, uh, you know, my career now, I'm a research and development scientist uh, for a company called Health Tech Connect. Um, and my job, we're, we're quite neurofocused right now, but my job is really to, to look forward to the future and, and what is the future of, of brain health and brain science and, and what does that look like uh the brain is you know as you may know it's it's one of the most sorry not one of the most it, it is the most complex organ they are um you might forget the number that's off my head but you know 10 billion neurons with billions of like trillions of different connections and synapses and it you know the brain regulates the entire body from top down it is the control center uh of everything we do is governed and regulated by the brain on, on some level um, and it's, it's incredibly complex and we know so little about it, uh, you know, um, from a, like a holistic perspective. Um, and everybody ages, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia is, is something that is, you know, heavily prevalent in our society, traumatic brain injury, strokes, concussion, uh, you know, brain injuries can affect people in, in so many different ways. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of treatment is really just hope for the best, uh, you know, try to live as, as clean and healthy a lifestyle as possible. Um, and so what, what we're trying to build at my company right now is this concept of, of brain vital signs. So, uh, you know, we spoke about heart rate and blood pressure earlier. Like we have, we know what a healthy heart rate should be, right? If I measure uh, one of your heart rates today and it's, you know, 160 and you haven't done any exercise, you can go, okay, well, maybe there's something there. Or you have an irregular heart rate because we can see, uh, you know, the, the heart rate waveform. Or we look at blood pressure and if your blood pressure is, you know, far out of 120 over 80, there are some things that we need to look at in terms of how can we correct that to normal because, you know, increased like hypertension is it creates a risk of stroke and uh, I think other you know other complications. And so, we the the takeaway here is that we have vital signs for the body, but we don't have vital signs for the brain. We don't have accessible, uh, you know, easily identifiable um, brain vital signs. Essentially, like there's no way of of doing a quick. Uh, uh, you know, I hate to bring up Star Trek, but like a quick, you know, scan of brain function. Um, and so that that's kind of what we're trying to create. We're trying to see, okay, well, how does the healthy brain work? And how can we measure that so that we can understand when uh, brain function deviates from healthy? So, you know, if you're concussed, we can then track uh, your your recovery from, from concussed back to healthy. If you have a traumatic brain injury, uh, if you have uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, like what does that process look like? 
And then on the other side of that is, okay, well, now that we can measure brain function, now that we can objectively uh, put a number on how your brain is operating, we can then better uh, test and evaluate uh, new treatments for brain function. Um, whereas previously, a lot of, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of tests, I'm, I'm use concussion as, as an example, because I've been through that process a lot. You know, a lot of the tests for concussion are like, well, how are you feeling today? How is your headache on a scale of one to 10? And, you know, it's very difficult, um, but not impossible to rate a headache. But it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to say, okay, well, my attention span has dropped by three points. So you don't really know that. It, you can't expect an injured brain to accurately assess itself. It, it doesn't work that way. So we need like an objective, like a numeric framework uh, for brain function. And so, yeah, that's me. Um, but this is, this is what we're building. It's called NeuroCatch. Uh, it works using EEG which is, uh, stands for electroencephalography, which basically just records brain waves. And so we look at how the brain processes information uh, and we can basically rank that because we know how the healthy brain should respond because we look at hundreds of people's healthy brains and that gives us like a pattern, like a characteristic profile of what <clears throat> healthy or uh, neurotypical brains function. And so, uh, when someone is injured or when someone is kind of deviates away from that like healthy brain status, we can then track that. So the brain responds to, to patterns in very characteristic ways. So one of the things uh, that you can do is, is you present a patterns of information. We use the auditory, you can use visual, uh, you can present stimulus or, or patterns in, in a lot of different ways. And when you change patterns up, your brain is actually very good at picking up that information. So if I had to say to you a sentence that goes, the pizza is too hot too, your brain is naturally trying to jump one step ahead and fill in those gaps. And you know, you know that the word I'm gonna say, the pizza is too hot too, sing. And then if you say a word that kind of violates that, uh, breaks the pattern, so to speak, your brain responds in, in a very different way. And that, like, that response is measurable using EEG. Now, the flip side of that is that the impaired brain or uh, the injured brain doesn't respond in the same way. And so that's how we can then start uh, figuring out where the, where the gaps are. Now, in terms of uh, development, um, so what I do, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a little bit of everything. Uh, we're, a, we're a startup company, so, um, you know, we're all heavily involved in, in all aspects, but we, we create a platform. So we build the hardware. Um, we, we write the software that's on the cloud now. Um, and then a lot of my research is focused on the analytics. So, okay, well, now that we've able to record brain information, uh, we're recording how the brain is processing uh, stimuli, or we, we can see how the brain is processing patterns. The challenge now is to then pull out identifiable, uh, important, relevant metrics. And so that, that takes a lot of signal processing, takes a lot of machine learning, it takes a lot of AI um, and kind of uh, data science uh, to be able to extract metrics that we can then put out and that we can then test to see, to see how they work. Uh, oh, there you go. That slide kind of tells that. Um, and so, quickly, this is uh, this is some research that I did with a group of ice hockey players uh, in um, Minnesota, in the states. Uh, so we took a team of ice hockey players and we kind of scanned them at a baseline time point, which is kind of before their season started, um, and then. If any of the players got concussed, we scanned them again just off the ice. Uh, and then they went through their kind of their post concussion recovery process. And then once the doctors told those players they were uh, fine or recovered, they can go back to play, we then scanned them again. Um, and so through this process, through you know, using the stimulus, reading the brain waves, applying fancy algorithms to get brain vital signs, um, this is kind of the the results we get is we see this, this kind of symmetrical, almost hexagonal, uh, healthy profile 
Um, when it plays an engine, it kind of shifts to this, this more of a triangular profile because the data in three of these metrics gets larger and smaller, uh, and some of them get smaller. Um, and interestingly, when we looked at the results from when players had been told that they were recovered, uh, we saw changes that were more closely related to the concussion than to baseline. Um, and so what this tells us is that a, the current like clinical concussion, re, you know, recovery processes are uh, maybe not conservative enough. Um, and that like players are being cleared to play while still showing some signs of impairment in this case, uh, in a measure of attention. Um, but B, that what we're looking at is actually really, really, really sensitive to brain function, which is super cool. Uh, and so we're doing a, a lot more work on this and I'm very happy to, to talk about uh, some concussion research if you're interested afterwards. And so where we're we moving now, this is kind of a project we did a couple of years ago uh, to look at, <coughs> excuse me, to look at how we can start to use this uh, in the general population and healthy people. Uh, and so we built an iPad app that can basically do this with an off the shelf EEG system you can get from Best Buy um, versus you know, these incredibly expensive like medical uh, tools um, to try and see how, uh, yeah, how, how this could be used on a, on a wellness scale from day to day. So the same way that, you know, I wake up and I check my Fitbit to see how many steps I've done. Uh, would I do the same uh, to see if, you know, my brain is functioning great? You know, should I have that extra cup of coffee? That type of thing. Uh, so this is, this is a really fun project. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about, this is uh, uh, a friend of Mine called uh, Trevor Green, who I've had a, a great privilege of working with uh, him and, and my, my former PhD supervisor uh, on this project called Project Iron Soldier now. Um, if you Google him, uh, Trevor Green, some really fascinating uh, story. He was injured in um, Afghanistan in 2006, I think. Uh, so a fairly long time ago, he, he had a very, very, very traumatic brain injury. Uh, the doctors told him he would never walk again, would never talk again. Um, Trevor <laughs> did not did not believe that, and he, he's really been, um, yeah, a model of <clears throat> uh, changing the scientific perspective on what's called neuroplasticity. Uh, because you know, in this case, Trevor's walking here assisted with uh, a robotic exoskeleton, which a is super cool. Um, he calls himself Iron Man, <laughs> which is awesome, but it just shows how far, how far he's come um, and what he's been able to do. So neuroplasticity uh, is the brain's ability to rewire itself and create new neural connections. And you're constantly doing this throughout your life. Your brain is forming new connections between neurons, new synapses. Uh, it's forming new networks constantly. It does this a lot more when you're young and a little bit less when you're old, but it's, it's an ongoing process. It's always, always, always adapting. Um, traditional healthcare in terms of traumatic brain injuries has said that whatever progress you, you make, uh, sorry, whatever progress you don't make in the first six months after a, a massive brain injury, you're never gonna get that function back. And Trevor's challenging this still because he's still making huge improvements in his recovery, you know, 14, 15 years after his injury. And he uses a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of techniques in terms of like visualization and, and focus and, you know, practice and all these things. Um, but <clears throat> the, the take home here is that uh, your brain is incredibly brilliant at what it does. Uh, and if it's given the right conditions, there's, there's no injury that we can't bring people back from using the right technologies and, and the right approaches. Uh, so yeah, I think um, that actually takes us to, to 7.40. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I feel like I, I spoke a lot. I hope that was, uh, that was informative. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to answer some more questions as we go forward. All right, thank you. Um, okay, let's see. I have a few questions for you, um, Mr. Vickling. So my first question is, how did you become a senior research and development scientist at Healthcare Connex? 
health tech comics. Like, what was the process like, you know, transitioning from a student to a senior research and development scientist? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's, that, yeah that's a great question. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's obviously very different. Um, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, I went straight from high school into my undergraduate, straight from my undergraduate into my master's, straight from my master's into my PhD. So I really was doing uh, a lot of research and a lot of kind of more scientific focused things. Um, through my PhD, uh, which I did at Simon Fraser University here in, here in Vancouver, uh, I was connected with Halt Tech Connects. I, I kind of worked for them part time. Uh, along the way, because they were doing something very similar to, to what my research was in, in concussion. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I started consulting with them and I had that opportunity. And then the moment I finished my PhD, I kind of moved over and started working for them full time into that position. Uh, so the, the difference in industry is that in academia, like in, in your in your university, um, whether it's undergrad or, or masters or PhD, research is quite um, it's quite fluid. You can there's a lot more freedom. Whereas in industry, like I spoke earlier about the make, um, the regulatory like medical device process, uh, it's a lot more rigorous in terms of what you have to do. So there's a lot more uh, documentation and paperwork, and uh, you know like kind of. You know how in, uh, I guess in, in like your math classes, you have to show you're working out for everything. Uh, yeah, the medical device industry is very much like that, but but multiplied by <laughs> multiplied by ten. So that was that was a big um, big surprise for uh, for me. Uh, but again, it's obviously all you know really important and necessary. So it was it was something I wasn't expecting, but I'm getting used to that. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, I'll start reading out some of the questions from chat now that they're coming up. Our first question is from Cheryl Chen. She asked, what findings in your concussion research have been most surprising? Oh, um, excellent question as well. Uh, so I didn't show that because it's, it's quite a lot to talk about, but that same group of hockey players that we looked at um, in that, that same team, uh, the players that did not, that were not diagnosed with concussions, um, we, we looked at their data from before the season and we looked at their data at the end of the season. And we also noticed some changes in their, in like metrics of brain function that occurred in players who were not injured during the season. And so that was a quite surprising and B, it tells you two things. It, it says either they are uh, getting concussed and it's not being diagnosed, which is a problem, or B, they are kind of gradually accumulating some form of like mild impairment over the course of the season because of the repetitive head impact nature of the sport. You know, even if you play in a game, in, in whether it's hockey or rugby or football or, you know, it's a contact sport there's still impacts to the brain that are what are called subconcussives. They're below a threshold that would uh, create an injury. And a lot of the, the learned, like other researchers other than like myself and my research group are finding this as well, uh, using MRI, using all sorts of like neurotechnology. Um, and so that's been, that's been really interesting is like, okay, well, how do we how do we measure this and how do we make sure that that participating in contact sport isn't setting someone up for you know degenerative brain disorders and so there's uh there's a lot we don't know in this space i want to be very clear on that uh these are more questions than answers um but it's it's a very exciting and interesting new field and there's a lot that we still need to figure out so that was definitely the most surprising for me oh, thank you for that answer all right, our next question is from Tian. He asks, is it easy to transfer from engineering physics to bioengineering? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, nothing's ever easy. Um, it's, it's straightforward, I'll, I will put it that way. The, the translation is, is pretty simple. Like, fortunately, physics 
uh, physics is physics, regardless of which industry you're applying it to. Um, the laws of the universe are pretty consistent. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, a lot of people who do uh, study fit, like not engineering physics, like just physics itself, actually go into medical imaging because uh, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is, is one of the most like complex phys like physics uh, applications out there. I will say that the transfer from engineering physics to bioengineering is, is not so much about maintaining your physics, it's about adding in biology. Um, that was really hard for me. That's the bit I struggled with because I, I didn't take biology in, in, as to grade 12 in high school and I didn't take biology in my undergraduate. Uh, and so when I moved into biomedical, I actually had to take a, a few uh, classes that like medical doctors were taking. I took anatomy, I did like cadaver dissection, I had to take physiology, uh, you know, I had to take a bunch of these uh, classes that I was very inexperienced in. Um, and so it was actually quite eye opening. Um, but weirdly enough, having only really been exposed to like math and physics and comp sci and code, you know, to, to actually take classes in biology and medicine and anatomy and learn about how the body works was so eye opening. I, I really loved it. So I think it's more, it's more about adding in the bio than it is um, making the physics more complicated, if that makes sense. All right. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Alyssa G. She asks, did you know for sure from very early that bioengineering is what you want to do? <laughs> or how have you come to the realization that bioengineering is what you want to pursue? Yeah, uh, <laughs> the answer to that is from very early, no, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I think if you asked me when I was five years old, what I wanted to be when I was old, I probably would have said like an astronaut or an inventor. Uh, I, I don't know where I got that idea from, but I it must have seen like a cartoon or like Inspector Gadget or something. Um, but I wanted to create stuff. I wanted to build things. And so I, I knew, I knew even from like early high school that I wanted to do engineering or like be involved in technology somehow. Um, but it was only it was only like very late in my undergrad and almost like midway through my masters when I realized exactly what I wanted to do, and even then I was planning on on going into um, like studying movement and looking at like sports injuries. I was I did my masters in uh, anterior cruciate ligament injuries and, and looking at like how movement patterns predict injury risk, uh, and then I took a very big pivot into brain technology. So uh, I guess the answer there is that. You, you may never know what you want to pursue. Like I, you know, I, at some point I might want to go back into parts or lungs. You know, um, I think the <laughs> the answer there is just find something that interests you, find something you're curious about, um, and explore that as much as far as you want. Yeah, that's very good life advice. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is from Skylar. Uh, she asks, "What is the benefit?" from getting a bachelor's degree to a master's to a PhD? And what is the workplace like in your career? Yeah, um, there, there's no, I will say there's no one right way of doing it. Um, I decided to go all the way through to PhD uh, because I was mostly driven by the curiosity and, and that like desire to do research and that desire to explore. Um, you can do, you can be a biomedical engineer with, with an undergraduate. Um, you can be a biomedical engineer with an undergraduate that's not even in biomedical engineering. You can just do mechatronics or, you know, computer science or system. Like there, there's so many other ways. Um, because the companies that are involved in, in biomedical engineering require so many different skill sets. Like my, my company right now that I work for, not my company, the company I work for, uh, you know, we have people who studied law degrees, we have people who did uh, statistics, you know, people who studied math or e economics, um, because there's so many transferable skill sets into everything. Like we're, we're a startup company, you know, which means we're small and uh, what they call quite agile. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's again, it comes back to like, if everybody in the company studied the same degree, we wouldn't get anywhere because there'd be no like diversity of thought or experience or education. Um, so yeah, I, I think 
the same thing comes down to bachelor's versus master's versus PhD. Uh, the real question is what, what your goal is. I don't think you need a PhD to do anything. Um, you, you need a PhD if you want to specialize in research or you need a master's if you want to specialize in research. But if you want to specialize in the application or the uh, design or the development, like you can very easily go in with, with a bachelor's degree as well. All right, thank you for that. Our next question is from Patrick Zed. He asks, who would you say you look up to the most in the field of biomedical engineering? Oh, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Uh, <laughs> I should have looked at that question. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's, there's someone I look up to in biomedical engineering specifically. I think there are a lot of people uh, that are very creative in very different industries. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I, I will, I'll maybe go in the other direction. I think there's some good examples of what not to do. Um, <laughs> there was a, a company called uh, Theranos, um, and there's a great HBO documentary about them. Uh, they, they tried to make, uh, they tried to make a, a rapid blood test that could do like hundreds of thousands of, of tests on your blood for cancer and all sorts of things, uh, in a fraction of the time using just a drop of blood versus having to do, you know, the whole syringe. Um, but they they didn't actually do any of the research and development. Like they didn't prove that they could do it. And so they were already selling their technology. And we go back to that medical device circle I showed, they were in sales when they hadn't even finished the R and D. Um, and I think it's, it's just a, uh, you know, it's a warning to the industry really of, of what not to do and, and that you have to go through the steps and you have to, you know, you have to show you're working out at the end of the day in order to, in order to, to make technologies that actually help people. I think they had a great idea um, and I think there are some other companies right now that are kind of trying to do the same thing. But sometimes when you have these, these big, you know, what they call like moonshot ideas that, that could change the world or change healthcare, it does take a lot of time to, to fully explore that and to make sure that you are actually creating that change. So, you know, for me, I think that's, uh, it's a good lesson in, um, yeah, in, <laughs> in what to do. Yeah, speaking of exploring things in biotechnology, Lisa K, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, sorry. Um, she asks, what's one area of biotechnology that you haven't explored yet, but really want to? Yeah, I think, um, I think genetics. I think in another life, would I would learn more about genetic engineering, uh, like CRISPR, um, you know, the ability to like just map the human genome, but also to, to affect it or to, you know, to, yeah, to build these incredibly complex biological, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even know enough about it to describe it. So I think that for me, that's something I'd love to explore is just to understand how genetic engineering works. Oh, cool. All right, our next question is from Angela X. She asks, can you give some advice for someone who's not sure which specific biology major she should get into? Smiley face. <laughs> um, I, I think I'll, I'll say the same thing I, I said earlier. You know, there's no, there's no one right field or major for every person. Like there's no, you know, one size fits all uh, approach. Um, so I, I'll always recommend choose the one that you're most curious about. Choose the one that, uh, you know, keeps you up at night wondering. You know, choose the one that makes you want to ask questions. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the best advice I have is, is choose the one that, that you're curious about. So yeah, basically go for where your heart is. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question is from. I'll, I will. I will add to that as well. Sorry. Let me. Like, let me follow up on that. Um, and the reason the reason you should do that is because a, just intrinsically motivating, 
um, but B, there really is no wrong approach to this. Like there's, there are so many different paths to get to a career in science. Um, and there's no, there's no one road to get, to get there. But like, the, like it sounds kind of hippie and, uh, you know, a bit kumbaya, but it really is the only thing in science is curiosity. And, and if you're driven by that, nothing else matters. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> All right. I'm um, sorry for interrupting you there. Our next question is from Simran. She asks, has your company's technology been implemented in hospitals or other <laughs> medical settings? Yes, uh, we're getting there. Uh, we have a version version 1.1 is out in Canada right now. It's, it's approved by Health Canada as a class B medical device, I think. Um, and it's currently used in, in some clinics. Uh, you know, we did a very small release. I think it's only 50 or 60 devices out and we're basically just gathering feedback. Um, and we're using that to, to build our version two, which we are releasing later this year. In version two, we're going to go for FDA approval and we'll, we'll try releasing the states. Um, so we are, we, we have rolled out to some hospitals and medical settings, um, but we're not currently a diagnostic tool. So right now we're just measuring and, and reporting brain function. And so what we're hoping to be able to do is develop the analytics on, you know, on a later stage that we can actually start to make diagnoses that we can actually start to say, okay, um, based on these scan results, this person has a 93% chance of being concussed. Uh, you know, or a 51, you know, being able to use the information that we've recorded to provide uh, more diagnostic information. That's the, that's the next step for us. So, you know, it's a, it's a slow process and we're, we're currently just doing our research right now um, while our first version of the device is, is out in the world. Okay, cool. All right, our next question is from Alyssa G. She asks, how did you survive so many years of schooling? Or is school enjoyable for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. People, my friends ask me that because they always, they all thought I'm ridiculous. Like I, I think, you know, the only one of my friend group who's, uh, yeah, was in university for so long. Um, honestly, after, you know, school is school. Uh, you know, it has its pros and cons. Um, I think for me is university and, you know, doing an MS, a master's and a PhD really was driven by that curiosity. Like I wanted to explore those injuries. I wanted to learn more about the brain or, you know, ACL injuries. Um, but after a point, it, especially in like, once you transfer from, undergraduate to most to postgraduate it's very different postgraduate is very much more of a job it, it is kind of a nine to five like they are you are still taking classes um but the the process is very different to undergraduate or high school which is very much like show up um attend your classes uh do your tutorials um you know your quizzes and write your tests and your exams and your assignments and hand them in um Postgraduate is one very, very, very long project uh, that lasts a few years and there are a lot of deliverables and like there's project management steps you take along the way and you're the only person responsible for that. Um, so it's, it's very different. And I, I was much better at that than I was at being an undergraduate or a high school student. I, found, I find the research very fascinating and I was much more engaged in it. Um, so I think the answer to that, Alyssa, is that like it, it just evolved for me over time. It became something different and it almost just became my job in a way. All right, thank you. Um, that gets us right to 8 p.m. actually. Uh, currently there are no more questions in the chat and I think everyone's probably asked what they wanted to ask. So thank you for coming here today, Dr. Fickley. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I love doing stuff like this. And, you know, I think if you, if you take one, <laughs> one lesson away from this, it's that, you know, if something interests you, just go chase it and, and see, just ask questions. Yep. All right.
Um, well, thank you for coming here, everyone, as well. Everyone's saying thank you, Dr. for and chat. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right. Well, all the best for the rest of your school year and uh, take care and be safe. Yep. Same to you. Oh, not the school year part. <laughs> 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 be safe. <laughs> yeah. All right.